I like to think that for as long as humans have been able to look up and gaze at the night sky, sharing stories in tales, in songs or in writing has endured as a universally powerful way to transmit information. And the magic of a good story was certainly not lost on my own parents and grandparents. Looking at myself in these pictures, I can't help but feel struck by the helplessness of the tiny creature they were reading to. It almost seems like humans are born too early with a brain that is far from mature, which means that we need to rely on our caregivers for a very long time. And from an evolutionary perspective, this really doesn't make any sense. So how come we're still around, thriving even? Well, it turns out being born with an immature brain comes with one major advantage. Our capacity for adapting ourselves to our environments is the largest of any animal on the planet. Far into our childhoods and beyond, our brains continue to be molded and shaped by our experiences. So the brain you were born with, and the one that is currently listening to this TED talk, are quite different. And our brains need to be adaptable, because humans need to learn a lot and fast. And this learning is not just about memorizing new information, it is also, and perhaps even most importantly, about learning what matters. How do you teach a child what matters? Well, you allow them to experience life. This thing hurt me the last time I touched it. I better steer clear, but this other thing tasted really good. I wonder if there's some more. It seems like the most natural and straightforward thing, and we've all seen this happen in, in toddlers or even in our pets. But it's actually this feature that is so difficult to replicate in artificial intelligence. And why is that? Can't we just program the information about what is good and bad in the world into some kind of computer algorithm? Well, it turns out it's not that simple. Let's say you offer me a drink. Seems like a pretty simple decision. But the chances of me accepting your kind offer are not just a trade-off between my thirst levels and the fullness of my bladder. So many more variables will come into that decision. Where I am, uh, if I'm alone, uh, what time of day it is, if I'm in a hurry, if I know you. And still remarkably, I'm able to reach my decision in a matter of seconds. The computer doesn't know what is good for us or what is meaningful, even if it hurts. But our brain does. Even if we ourselves don't understand exactly how. So it's no wonder that scientists working in neuroscience and those in artificial intelligence are now teaming up to figure out exactly how humans manage to make sense of this continuous stream of information that is reaching our senses at any moment. And one thing that we know for sure is that it would be impossible to take in and process all of that information at a conscious level. So even if we come into this world with an immature brain, there must be some kind of built-in filter that allows us to automatically cancel out all of the irrelevant information and focus only on the relevant, the meaningful, the salient signals. Salience, huh? Wasn't that the word that was on the title slide? You could think of salience as what stands out what catches your attention, what draws you in. Salience is the reason. You will look at the red dot in this picture, but not in this one. 
Salience is the filter that is crucial to learning and universally present among all intelligent life. All intelligent life. How about artificial intelligence? Can a computer algorithm learn which objects are salient? Yes, but only to an extent. A computer algorithm designed to classify pictures can learn which visual features are salient based on their shapes, numbers, sizes, colors. But our salience, the human kind of salience, doesn't just depend on the physical characteristics of the object, the bottom-up characteristics, the sensory information. It is also heavily influenced by top-down processes, all the conscious and unconscious motivations present in your brain that also change over time in some kind of lifelong feedback loop. Let's see an example. If I were to tell you that a computer algorithm recently successfully taught itself to distinguish a cat from a coconut, you'd probably be less than impressed. And if I were to ask you to point out the difference between these two pictures, you'd probably not start by describing their shape or their colors, it's more likely that you would tell me about how each of these are salient to you. One is a furry animal that I can cuddle and play with, and the other is a food that can be made into a delicious exotic cocktail. It's even possible that just looking at these pictures, you actually experience the uh, memories of the physical uh, experience of having the cat purring in your lap, or drinking that cocktail at the beach. So both of these are salient to us, although in different ways. And that's why it's so easy for us to identify them and distinguish them from one another. So while computer algorithms are becoming better at making predictions, the human brain goes way beyond. It will intuitively link past with present experiences, make projections far into the future in an infinitely dynamic, context-dependent and highly individual way. And this is actually really surprising, because in general, humans are really bad at processing information. Complex calculations require a lot of brain power and consume a lot of energy, and our biology doesn't do well with that. So how come we are still so good at this? Well, there's a secret. We invented a shortcut called feelings. Have you ever wondered about the purpose of emotions, of feelings? They've been part of our biology for a very long time, so probably they do serve some kind of function. It seems emotions are meant to help us make complex choices without putting in all of the uh, conscious brain power and all of the effort. And these emotions control a large part of what is salient to us. And it's exactly this aspect that is so difficult to mimic in artificial intelligence. Now, here's where it becomes really interesting to me. Because in my work as a psychiatrist, I'm confronted at a daily basis with what happens when things go wrong with feelings and with salience. And a particularly compelling example is that of psychotic illness. Psychotic illness is seen as one of the most severe types of mental disorders, and they will affect up to 3% of all people at some point in their lives. They're characterized by episodes of psychosis, which means the person loses touch with reality, and they suffer from delusions or hallucinations. Now, during such a psychotic episode, the built-in filter that we call salience is broken. And a tsunami of information comes into the brain 
way too much for anyone to handle, unfiltered like that. So by looking at psychotic disorders, we can learn about how salience normally works. What normally happens when you look at something interesting or new or unexpected, like the red dot on the slide before, a spike of dopamine is fired in a very specific area of your brain called the limbic region. And this shot of dopamine will make you go, hmm, that's interesting. But in a psychotic episode, the dopamine doesn't spike, it floods continuously, excessively. What does that feel like? Well, patients with a psychotic episode will tell me that at first, it feels like something really big, really important is about to happen. Although they can't say exactly what or why they even know this, there is just this weight pressing on them that is too big to be ignored. Gradually, all the regular things of daily life that would normally go unnoticed, let's say some cars parked in your street, they start to catch your attention in a very unsettling way. And what happens next? Well, the brain does what it always does. It tries to come up with some kind of logical explanation for why we are currently having this strange experience. It tries to come up with a um, reasonable scenario for why this white car looks so suspicious. Maybe it's a government ca uh, car that came here to spy on us. And then add in some confirmation bias, allowing these thoughts to further strengthen and crystallize, and you end up with fixed delusional ideas that a person cannot let go of, even when they're proven wrong. And we know this because when we add medications that block dopamine, the person will then experience that what felt very off to them before doesn't bother them so much anymore now. So salience comes first, and rational thought comes later. The brain comes up with logical explanations to match the feelings, and not the other way around. And this is exactly why it's so hard, nearly impossible, to convince someone uh, who suffers or who believes in conspiracy theories. The belief is not rational, and so it cannot be countered by rational arguments. It's also the reason why humans in general are really bad at processing information, except when it's packaged as a good story. Because stories are salient, they touch our feelings, and therefore we remember them. So to conclude, salience lies at the heart of our subjective experience, but it's also what makes us vulnerable to rational thinking and bad decision-making. And in those with the most severe types of psychotic illness, we can see salience malfunction at its worst, sometimes with excessive or misguided salience during the psychotic episodes, but sometimes, at the later stages of the disorder, salience can also run out. And without salience, the, words, the world becomes bleak and desolate and will feel disconnected. And this is why, after more than 10 years of research, I still consider psychotic illness both as one of the most cruel, but also one of the most important types of mental illness. And it's also why I'm sure that machines will never make humanity redundant. No amount of computational power can emulate salient intuition, because creating meaning is our job, a human's job. I am a psychiatrist, and this was my story. I hope it was salient to you.